So it looks to me as if there's there's no more latecomers arriving at the moment. Uh, welcome everybody uh, on this fine November morning in the in the middle of what we now call lockdown 2.0. Uh, let's let's hope it doesn't last too long. Uh, so welcome to FM lessons learned from COVID. We're joined today by Richard Kent from King's College London and by Joe Nettleton from Havas. Uh, with us as well is, is John, our MD, and um, I am obviously really do to see I am the Director of Operations for LCMB. So just a little bit of background about LCMB. Our mission is to transform workplaces. Uh, we, we've been very privileged in working with both Joe and, and uh, Richard to achieve this. So if you want to find out any more, John's details are on screen. And as always, we will share this, this webinar with people uh, once it's completed. Uh, it will also be available as a video on YouTube. Uh, sorry, there's just a, a few late arrivals I'm letting in. OK, so our objective for today is very simple. We're very lucky to be joined by, by two people from world class organizations. So we just want to pick their brains and learn a little about how they are dealing with the disruption caused by COVID. So over to them. Uh, if I start with you, Joe, just in no particular order, because you're first on my screen, if, if, if you just want to introduce yourself, please, and uh, you are still muted. My name is Joe Nettle. I'm the head of facilities here at Habas. Uh, I work, we're a uh, creative and media communications company um, spanning sort of all sorts of communications disciplines. There are uh, 24 companies working with about sort of 1800 people working out of our flagship village we call it office in um, Kings Cross London. Thanks Joe. Richard? Thanks Rudy. Uh, morning everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Kent. I'm the uh, Associate Director for Campus Operations for the Health Campuses of King's College London. Uh, King's is uh, the most central London University um, and one of the top 20 universities in the world. Um, as I said, I work in the health campuses, so I'm mostly focused around um, the, the medical research that goes on there, and we share sites across the health campuses with uh, King's College Hospital, Guy's Hospital, and St Thomas's Hospital. But we've also got um, a large uh, flagship campus on the Strand and Bush House, uh, which mostly houses arts and sciences. Thank you, Richard. Uh John, over to you then. OK, thank you. So um, I'm just going to start with um, with some questions for, for both Richard and Joe. And as Rudy said at the beginning, uh, if you do want to ask a question of either Richard or Joe as, as we run through the session today, please just raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll come to you. So Rudy is just going to remove the, um, the, the, the presentation from the um, from the webinar and I'll get going with questions. So I'm going to start with you, Joe. Um, I guess the first question I have is from your perspective, what impact has COVID-19, both in terms of lockdown 1.0 and uh, 2.0 to use Rudy's terminology, had on Havas? Well, I suppose we're lucky in a sense, um, as unlike some sectors, it's largely, largely possible to do what we do from home. Uh, and that said, you know, while technology has made it possible to do a version of our jobs, say our jobs, not my job as a head of facilities, but, but the, the office that I work within and their roles, um, it, it's not close to replicating what can be achieved face to face, you know, with, with the creative process. That's what we're hearing from the business. Um, so, so that's why back in June, we made an early pledge to be the best organised, fastest moving, obviously in line with government guideline, uh, you know, London HQ of a communications business to get people back in the front door, which allowed us to sort of establish an office environment, which almost got to feeling almost normal. Um, you know, we were, we were up to about 600 people, which is say a third of the of the you know daily capacity of the office. Um, while you know our our competitors were hadn't even opened their doors yet. Um, of course, we now find ourselves in another lockdown. But our learnings over the past five months has made uh, me confident that 
we can hit the ground running again as soon as as soon as uh, we we're allowed, really. OK, thank you, Joe. And Richard, can I ask you the same question? What impact has COVID-19 had on, on Kings, both in terms of the first lockdown and I guess more recently in terms of the imposition the government are putting on universities to return students home? Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a massive impact on us um, as it has on the whole of the higher higher education sector. Um, we initially, when we went first went into lockdown, um, there was there was trying to get the uh, the students home and, and essentially writing off the end of the last academic year, um, and then we were essentially looking at a two hundred million pound gap in our income when we thought we were going to have to write off a good part, if not all of. Uh, this current academic year that then changed um, uh, as we had sort of the easing off of um, uh, the cases over summer and, and it became clear that we had a lot of applicants, more applicants than we were actually expecting to join uh, as students in 2020-2021. In, uh, um, so we had to, we went from locking down um, vast, vast parts of our campus into trying to open it up again uh, and making it COVID safe for the students to come back and uh, and as you say, John, now we've gone into the second lockdown and the government has given us this directive to um, get students home for Christmas. Uh, we're now desperately trying to set up testing stations and, and work with the NHS so we can uh, uh, we can get every student, every student who wants it, we can't force it, every student who wants it tested between the uh, 30th of November and the 9th of December so that they can get home for Christmas. OK, so you both, um, I guess, experienced a bit of a roller coaster over the, um, the, the first and second lockdowns, like many organisations. Uh, Joe, coming back to yourself, um, you know, what steps uh, did Havas need to take um, again, initially in that first lockdown and more recently in the second lockdown to become COVID secure? Well, Certainly, it was the first lockdown and the, our opening the doors on the 1st of June that involved, you know, there's a, there's a team of about 20 of us in building services. It was a whole team effort, first of all, from home, getting uh, the risk assessment done and then all of the outputs that fall out of that, all of the, uh, all of the materials for communication with our staff. We've got a handbook. We got our, one of our design companies, Comran, to design a whole theme of our return to work. We branded it. We called it WorkSafe Plus. So it's all, it, it's a running theme and it's all branded. And so we did the risk assessment and then all of the controls that fell out of that, of which, you know, there are hundreds. But broadly speaking, you know, you walk in the front door, it looks very different. Now, our lovely reception is no longer full of couches. It has lanes with thermographic cameras that take your temperature on arrival. Um, you're issued masks at reception if you require them or don't have a face covering. Uh, you must wear those in the lift. You know, there's hand sanitizer at every station. There's a QR code on your desk that you must sign in with each day that enables us for our track and trace procedure. I'm, in fact, I'm sat in the meeting room now. So when I arrived, I had to scan in this QR code. So. Certainly the office is very different and one, I don't know how it affects other industries, but certainly a creative industry like ours. We've got 160,000 square foot here and half of it is meeting rooms, collaboration areas, breakout spaces, you know, that sort of thing. So, and we've got stairway, accommodation stairs that break through the floors. We've got the two fire stairs, but these stairwells that break through every floor are designed to spark collaboration and, and creativity you know the over the water cooler moments and we've had to shut all of those a lot of these open areas where we can not manage the population so well and obviously impose one-way systems throughout throughout the stairwell so the office does look and feel very different but that said once you get people back in it um it 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 starts to feel a bit more normal OK, thank you very much, Joe. And, and Richard, from your point of view, um, what steps did you make the King's Estate um, COVID secure for, I guess, both students and staff? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess all the, all the steps that, that Joe said around the reception spaces and, and the uh, um, white pods and sanitizers, 
when the students came back at, um, in the middle of September, we, we had a huge task leading up to that in um, replanning all our teaching spaces. We, you have um, lecture theatres that have capacity of 350 down to down to 30 or 35. Um, they're fairly easy to mark out, but the uh, we've got many teaching rooms with um, chairs in them, just you know banks of say 20 odd chairs with a pallet on them, or, or sometimes in front of a table. So we had to work very closely with our colleagues in our space planning team to basically just re-space plan every single room and, and then have teams of people going in there and the taking spare tables and chairs out and, and setting them up and, and making sure the plans are on there. So um, if students move the chairs, then, then we know how to move them back again. So that's been a huge task. I mean, that whole thing has obviously reduced the amount of teaching capacity we were able, we were able to have. So. We then had to go out and, and some procure some external spaces for for additional teaching, um, and and in uh, our three main campuses, we've now got marquees up in uh, various positions for for additional teaching as well. Um, the the real concern going into the start of year was that we we would be um, working in buildings that are reaching capacity. We had safe building capacities for for all of them. We've got 100 plus buildings that we use uh, across London. Um, so there was a series of sort of um, safeguarding meetings and, and committees set up to try and if someone wanted to come back to work, if, if there was a department that wanted to bring back um, a, a team of, say, 15 researchers back to work in some of the labs, they had to complete their risk assessments. This all had to be formally approved to make sure that we had um, we not only within the safe capacities of the buildings, um, but also that we had enough fire marshals and first aiders. In fact, we put so many people through additional fire marshal training course that perennial problem of not having enough fire marshals is just it's just disappearing we've now got hundreds and hundreds of fire marshals because they have to be trained if they want to come back so um yeah that's probably a plus and hopefully there'll be a plus going down the line but of course that fear of getting near capacity was just never realized we just didn't have the number of students and staff really who've come back so now we've got that extra problem of of safeguarding people who are um, working in, in, in very small numbers around very complicated buildings. So it's it's been a real challenge. OK, thank you for that, Richard. So, Joe, back to yourself. Um, have your customers and staff reacted um, in any way that surprised you to both the pandemic and what you've had to do with the office? Well, um, from a client perspective, uh, Thus far, we haven't been letting them in yet. You know, the office is, as it stands, still only open for staff uh, and, you know, for, for business critical need, really. In fact, presently, it's shut. We've literally got, I think, three people in the office due to the fact that they don't have broadband or something. That needs to be the reasoning now. But um, certainly uh, in, the, in, in the first iteration and, and, and in the early days, what we were hearing from a lot of people who were coming back to the office was, first of all, they were blown away by the amount of work that went in to that. I don't think they realised the undertaking that that uh, following the government guidance, however long it, the, the document that's become our Bible, I think it's about 50 pages, isn't it? The, the guidance for offices and contact centres. Um, you know, it's it's I don't think they realised how much work had gone into it. So first of all, they were very thankful that, that we put all the work in. And second of all, thankful to be back in the office. We've got, we've our demographic is quite young here. Most of the workforce is quite young. And I think we've got a lot of people who might flat share, who perhaps have one kitchen table and you're jostling for space with your with your three other flatmates, um, you know, who gets to be on a Zoom call on, on any given hour. So uh, a lot of people were very happy. And then the other thing was, there was a lot, a lot of trepidation, uh, you know, the first time around in, in, in June, July, people returning to the office. And then once you come back, you realise that actually, you know, you're travelling in perhaps a different way. Maybe you're cycling in or if you are getting on the train, there's a lot less people on it. And when you come to work, all of the control measures we put in place, I think there was, a, you know, almost an audible sigh of relief you have from people coming back into the building because actually it's not you know covid secure 
does make people feel quite safe. I think you don't really know that until you you come in and you come to work for a day. Okay, thank you, Joe. And I guess, Richard, the, the demographic at uh, King's is going to be slightly different because you've got a mix of students and, um, and staff. So from your perspective, how have the staff and the students reacted to both the pandemic and, you know, needing to come back to the estate? I think, I mean, we were, we, we were eligible for the, uh, the government furlough scheme. We didn't find that out actually until, uh, I think it was well into May that we could find out we could put staff on furlough, we could backdate it. But we, so we, we did manage to get quite a lot of staff on furlough, um, probably many actually in, in terms of our facilities teams, uh, which we only found out really retrospectively when we, we needed them back a bit sooner. But the, um, I, there was, and to an extent, still is. It's a, it's a, it's a generalisation, but it's, but it's true nonetheless. There was a, there is a, a bit of a, um, a latent feeling of, of mistrust, I guess, between the staff who are on furlough and the staff who, who came in. The staff who came in think the staff on furlough had a, had a nice relaxing summer and had a great time while they were, they were coming up to, to town and working hard. Um, but on the you flip it around the other side, I, I certainly know this from speaking to staff on furlough. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of a lot of unsurety. They think, well, I'm I'm not an essential member of staff, so I can't come to work. So actually, if we have to make some tough decisions in the future, I'm probably first in the firing line. So it's it's a very delicate balance you have to trot between between the two groups of staff. I think um, it was very interesting as well with a lot of our research staff. I said, you know. My campuses are, are primarily research based. Um, we had to stop quite a lot of critical research and we actually gave off, gave away quite a few of our um, research labs to, to COVID research um, and redeployed a lot of our staff on COVID research. In fact, any of you who've, uh, who've, who've been uh, um, taking part in the, in the Zoe um, uh, study that's been going along, that's, um, that's uh, King's, King's um, co um, co-run. So uh, uh, we've done a lot, a lot in terms of code research, but the other researchers, I think they've, um, you can't ask, you can, sorry, that's my, my, that's my landline. I'll just talk through it. There's no one else in the house to take it either. Um, yeah, the, you can't ask a, 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 a member of research team to say whether their research is critical or not, because it's a very, it's a very local, it's a very individual, um, Sorry about this. <laughs> yes, I, I, I was just going to say, Richard, I guess that proves that we're absolutely live. <laughs> it does, yeah. I'm afraid, just what my background looks like, I am working yeah. from home. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can't you can't get a research um, a researcher to define whether their whether their research is critical or not. You've got to make that decision higher up in the university. So there's quite a lot of um, quite a lot of issue there, and, in, and the students. Yeah, it's a really hard time, obviously, for, this, for the for existing students, um, certainly as the ones who are going into the dissertation time, that's not so bad for them. But the certainly the students who've, um, who've, who've joined us this year, you know, they're, they're the same group of students who've gone through um, the A-level fiasco. They, they, they've finished school early. They've, um, they haven't got their A-levels. They've had all that uncertainty about whether they can get to the university they wanted to do. The universities, including us, have had to open extra spaces. So it's been, uh, uh, and then of course they've come and they've got the freedom and students have acted like students always will, despite the fact that we haven't actually wanted them to. We're, we're very grateful for the likes of Glasgow and Manchester Met for taking the, taking the brunt of the uh, bad publicity about this, but that is pretty much reflected across, uh, across all of our, all our residences. Uh, and it's been very difficult for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Um, so, sorry. Can I just uh, follow up, uh, Richard? From from that point of view, in terms of of engaging with the research staff, did you have much assistance from your your other departments like HR and so forth, or or is it something that you had to deal with pretty much on your own? Um, I, I have to deal with it a bit. To be fair, I was kind of on the periphery of that. That's that's really something that's sort of dealt with by higher up within the faculties and our, our CIO level, they'll be defining who can come in and who can't. Um, you know, we, we're very much just the gatekeepers. Uh, and thankfully, we didn't have to turn too many people away. Okay, thanks. 
Yeah, and I was just going to pick up on your, your point, Richard. Kings have been um, quite extensively involved in the COVID response. I know I've, I've been responding to the to the app since the beginning, and that's I think the Zoe study that you 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 mentioned, um, yeah. which is I think been informing uh, some policy as well because it's it's got quite good coverage across the UK. Um, and I know the teams at Kings have been involved in a lot of the um, the, the, the early work um, around mapping. The progress of the uh, pandemic um so quite a bit of uh, input from from the team there so joe just coming back to you yourself um you know looking forward over the winter period currently we got lockdown 2.0 in place until the 2nd of december to potentially talking about allowing us to have a, a more extensive christmas period but from havasa's point of view what do you see as the challenge over the winter period and into the beginning of next year uh I mean, as a building, as a as a creative industry that wants to, that I think not 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 a decision made by me, but I think someone's you know run the numbers and and seen that we work better together. Um, as a creative industry that wants people to get people back in the building, I think depending on where the R number is, I think there will be more trepidation uh, um, among our staff. Look, we, we, we've taken all the necessary steps to empower people to work from home. We've undertaken DSC assessments with people, you know, sent kit home. We've run up a massive bill with our courier company, that's for sure. But that said, if for, for to, to make the creative process work, sometimes you just all need to be in a room, albeit the room now has to be twice the size it was um, last time, you know, we've, we've adjusted the reduced capacities. I think there may be a challenge for the business depending on, yeah, the prevalence of the virus, getting people back. Then from a building services perspective, we are being, at the moment, we're being reactionary, I suppose, as to depending on how many numbers we're getting in, we're not all of the floors we've got 10 floors there is no point having an army of cleaners cleaning 10 floors for half a dozen people to be in so for instance today we just only have the first floor and the seventh floor open we uh, have a media school that works out of our seventh floor so being a uh, being a school they they have stayed open um so so we it's a bit of a sliding scale so it's mobilizing the workforce with for certainly looking at cleaners big cost our restaurant another large cost and internally our building services staff a lot of these people are on furlough and with it due to not end until you know march uh it's that sliding scale of not not having too much expenditure for the amount of people in the building so that so that's a tricky one and then with the people on furlough certainly with with our team members uh I, th I think richard alluded to this you know you need to keep in contact with these people they've got they they want they want to feel they're still valued members of the team the fact of the matter is their job is just not a necessity right at this minute so it's keeping team morale up i think you know i think we're over the the, the friday quizzes we need to get a bit more ingenuitive as to as to how we're gonna how we're gonna keep our staff informed and involved but not working you know and on furlough throughout that period okay and um richard from your point of view um what do you see as the biggest challenge for for, for kings you students and staff over the winter period and into the beginning of next year well first of all i just absolutely echo what joe just said that everything there is absolutely valid for us and probably that's that's we work in very different um, areas, of course, but that that's probably a complete constant across the uh, the whole the whole uh, whole of the country, possibly the whole of the world. Um, I think I think for us, um, we've we've now started to plan for the uh, our second semester in teaching. So we we started in in September with with some kind of blended learning. Um, as we went towards the second lockdown, everything that could moved on to online. Teaching. We had to keep some clinical teaching, um, some face-to-face -face teaching in, in, in some of the medical uh, dental areas, for instance. Um, but across the whole of the university, we are behind on our teaching schedule. So at some point, this has got to pick up. And it doesn't at the moment look like that's going to be that's going to happen anytime soon. So we're going to 
further down uh, the academic year, we're going to face more of a problem. Um, uh, the immediate issue, as I, as I said right at the top, is trying to make sure we get all the um, all the students tested so they can go home for Christmas. That's a huge pressure on us um, for the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to keep those testing stations open partly for the any student who has a positive test and then needs to come then needs to self isolate and come back from another test. So still has time to do that uh, before we 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 close our doors um, before Christmas. Um, we're going to open that to staff as well, um, but trying to trying to get these tests off the NHS and set the spaces up to be able to um, run these tests is is hugely challenging and, and uh, in, incredibly complex. Um, I, I think just going back to staff as well, I think one of my my concerns about uh, about my teams and I know colleagues with similar teams have the same same concerns. Um, the FM teams and the engineering teams and uh, cleaner security. They've been working since March. They've been pretty much flat out, most of them. Um, and I know for a fact, I, I, I know myself, I feel myself, I think everyone's uh, quite exhausted. And I think there's a there's a real issue about burnout. And we're really trying to make sure that our staff can have a restful Christmas so they can come back. So that's, that's a real challenge for us as well, because obviously um, everyone else can go home at Christmas, but we've still got to keep the space and, and place running. Okay, thank you. I've just got a supplementary question and then I'll raise, there's a couple of questions our uh, attendees have raised. Um, so Joe, I mean, Havas, um, do you have a different view, um, the outlook going forward based on the current sort of good news on vaccines? Oh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's almost not for me to have a view. Our job is very reactionary we yeah. want, like we have that guidance book the offices the, the 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 guidelines for offices and contact centers and they up every time they update it we look at it and we read it again and we make sure that we're we're doing what the government um it, you know wants us to and dictates to us but um certainly yes of course it, it's all very positive and you know some vaccine however successful is going to be better than no vaccine at all um i think certainly amongst our uh, just within our building services team there's a couple of people there was a lot of talk when we came back to work about people being on the front line and we tried to quash that quite early due to the fact we, we're not in a war you know but 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 that's how our reception staff are referring to it and certainly some of our older staff who work for building services who are having to deal with people tactile things giving them passes in inducting them to the site uh talking to them on reception certainly they uh, once again you know those people are, are are enthused about it for sure and, and Richard, do you have a similar view, um, you know, from a King's perspective, the, in terms of the vaccine and its impact? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I think it's given us all a boost, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so these, uh, firstly, the uh, you know the, vac the the news a couple of weeks ago, and then and then the uh, the su supplementary news stories since. So I think yeah, it does give us a boost, but um, I, I think we all realise it's not going to happen anytime soon, really, um, uh, and we're probably again talking in the university sense we it's not going to be here to make any kind of material change to this academic year so um we've got to cope with it for certainly until well potentially uh, the whole of 2021 but um certainly up till at least the tail end of it okay uh really i think we've had a couple of questions from the attendees did you want to sort of re raise we those have with you, we you have yes so so we had a comment from Sriseran, apologies if I mispronounced that, uh, wondering why certain in industries is doing better than others. Uh, other of you have a view? In what regard? Uh, uh, Sriseran, do you want to unmute yourself and, and, and put your question? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, but I work in a healthcare sector. I work in a nursing home, very large nursing home. So I never stopped working during the pandemic. Um, and also, um, I'm a mental health nurse as well, myself. Uh, what I find in um, the care home sector is very complicated because is uh, the people we are looking after, they are over 65. And 
time to time they do get sent to hospital and and the restriction when they go to hospital and when they come back we have to do the barrier nursing we do everything as much as we could possibly can the sanitation and the ppe and everything um what, what my understanding is sometimes i find it struggle to understand if the healthcare industry is working still through the struggles of why are other industries because I am also attached to City University as well, so I know what how the students are actually going through in this uh, difficult time and the frustration they have just to having to follow just one lesson a week rather than two, three sessions would have been in the past. Um, and the, about, I just can't, I can't probably kind of figure out why the rest of the industry is struggling uh, in terms of um, working um, in the office or maybe working from home. OK, that, that, that's an interesting point. Uh, so Richard, you're probably the best place to, to address that, as I suggest. Yeah, I, I guess it, it depends. I mean, it's, um, I mean, there are some some industries or, or sectors which, which which clearly aren't able to continue, you know, firstly in the original lockdown and, and then as we came out. Um, so we've got um, a, a, quite a large team um, looking after our um, events um, at King's. So we probably it's not a huge amount of our income. It's probably less than five percent, but there's still a reasonable amount of income that we have from from letting out our university spaces, um, whether they be whether they be grounds, setting up marquees, uh, weddings. Uh, we've got some quite. Um, uh, some quite beautiful spaces that people will have for all kinds of events and, and, and our events team will help and coordinate that. Obviously, there's there's a food and drink offering on top of that, which is, uh, again, quite a nice boon to the to the, the university's coffers. Um, uh, and notwithstanding, you know, there's quite a lot of VIP events. So obviously that's just stopped. That, that stopped in, in March. Um, most of the, if not all of the, uh, the event staff have gone on furlough. Some of them come back actually to help us in other areas, we've had campus ambassadors and some of our event staff are helping us with that and sort of helping guide students and, and visitors. Um, but that that whole event, that whole sector has stopped. My, my son um, uh, works and, and lives in a pub. Obviously, he's back with us now because he can't do that. So, so there's a huge, um, huge gap in um, in the market and a huge gap in in uh, um, certainly for us. Um, we, it affected a lot of colleagues and affected, um, uh, you know, a reasonable chunk of the income of, of the university. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Thank, thanks, Richard. Thanks for your question, Shruthara. And apologies if I mispronounce your name. Uh, we have another comment from Adam as well, uh, saying that there's a, a noticeable change in people's approach from a majority wishing to have a one-to-one -one dedicated desk uh, and a fixed desk as a pre prerequisite to now wishing to work more flexibly and typically only sort of a couple of days a week in the office. Um, has either of you noticed a similar change in approach from the staff? Uh, Joe, if I come to you first. Yeah, so uh, um, so we were actually looking at going agile uh with, within our business and just before before covid happened you know at the tail end of last year and there's a whole behavioral change piece there you cannot just say to people right from now on you don't use your pedestal anymore here's your locker and sit at any desk you like it doesn't work like that people need to be coached and um it, so there's a whole change management bit there um, so we were we were sort of embarking on that road. We, we, we're well versed in in the physical moves of it. We we as companies expand. We've got 26 of them here in the building. As companies expand, contract, win new contracts, need to work together. We're forever moving people around the building. But we were just some of our companies have started on this agile journey and you know reduced their desk capacity by 20% or something. And we were going to we were starting to roll this out to the business as a whole. And then COVID happens, and it turns out that you don't need this big behavioural change learning piece. It was forced upon us, and I think the uh, I, I think you know it. 
uh, the human condition prove that we aren't we just resilient aren't we just a resilient bunch because everyone just just overnight you know changed the way they work so um so yeah i think going i i think people are less you know beholden to their desk and i think also now when we were introducing people back into the office the flexible working was then enforced upon them within the office space due to the fact that we had we had big x's on every opposing and adjoining desk so you couldn't be our desk we've thankfully we're lucky we've got sort of desks that are 14 uh, 1600 wide with screens between them so you could you couldn't sit closer than uh, two meters ne next to your closest colleague so you were sat next to you might have a mac and you were sat at, you might be sat at a pc users that so there's the first 20 minutes of every day where you're fiddling around with the wires you're trying to plug something in and and you you know there's, there's different ways to to skin that cat as it were and we just sort of pushed everything aside and laid on the the support heavy from a building services and it perspective and we're very reactive like that i know other my, my girlfriend works for another um for a media company and the doorbell rang one day and there was a bloke with an archive box who just put it in her hands and she took it and it had i mean someone had literally just scraped the table like that it had the the company water bottle it had a, a you know picture of a cat all sorts of stuff so um so yeah i think i mean the main thing to take away is the fact that that uh, we as a human population i think have just have just changed on on a dime you know and brilliantly so Okay, and, and do you think as a result of this, you might see a a lessened demand for space ultimately, or, or do you think it will come back to what it was before? I uh, look look around London. The the cranes are moving up and down still. I don't think that anyone uh, dreams that that space will become you know halve in value or or or, or become. Um, you know, un, un, unneeded. Uh, I think the the way we use our space will change. Yes, I think we've got we we uh, belong to a big holding company, Vivendi, uh, of which we have sister companies, Universal Music Group, Game Lost, Canal Plus. We we might be having some of these other entities within our within our umbrella. Uh, we're here at HKX, you know, it doesn't just have to be communications, you know, you, you know, let them let the music companies come. And, um, and so the way we use our space will change, you know. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Richard, from your point of view, obviously, it's, it's more difficult for somebody doing some some research at a at a research station to do that from remotely. But have you noticed the same sort of tweak in, in approach? Yeah, I have actually. Um, Joe's right. People are resilient. They 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 move straight to um, a different way of working. Um, whether that be in in the in the uh, buildings themselves, um, in in sort of COVID safe conditions, whether that be a lab or an office, uh, but also we we do did have, including myself, huge amounts of people working from home all of a sudden. Um, and I think. Uh, I certainly think myself I would quite like to stay with some kind of blended working from home uh, a bit more frequently than than I used to. I was lucky enough to be able to work from home one day a week. Uh, I have quite a commute. I'd quite like to be able to do that uh, possibly two or three days a week um, going forward. Um, and, and I know a lot of colleagues think the same. I think colleagues will probably be quite happy to work from home for, um, for however long they're with us. Uh, but equally, there's a lot of colleagues I know and, and we've had to uh, deal with them and find space for them um, who have been desperate to come back for work. We're not all, all lucky enough to have uh, comfortable spaces in our in our homes uh, with with access to fresh air and gardens. Um, so quite a lot of colleagues have been really desperate to come back from to work uh, and have been really since we, we first locked down and we've we've uh, we've worked hard to try and find them uh, pockets of space that they can they can safely use in some of our buildings. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk. Um, I was perhaps slightly flippant about students earlier, but there is a big issue that, that's well well covered in the press about student mental health. Um, but there's a big issue about staff mental health as well, 
Uh, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about making sure that uh, if people are working from home, are they genuinely comfortable in doing that? What are their options if they're not? Um, and making sure they have the, the constant contact and, and support um, in whatever model of working they're, they're going for, and that's going to be very, uh, very critical going forward. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I, th I think that addresses the questions we've had in the in the text. Uh, feel free to keep them coming. I'll, I'll hand over back to you, John. Okay, thank you for that, Rudy. Uh, so just building on on those sort of questions and those points, and um, coming back to yourself, Joe. Um, what, what what sort of long term differences do you think you you'll see both in London and in the workplace going forward? And and how do you think Havas will be forced to respond? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, it's back to flexible working, isn't it? Um, certainly, we realise that we don't all need to be in the office all of the time, and that in the long term, certainly not in the short term, perhaps not in the mid term, will surely be a cost benefit to, well, certainly our business, and I presume a lot of businesses, because you for 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 everybody, you now no longer need you know, six, five or six square meters, you need, you need half of that, but due to the fact that they're only in half the time. So, um, so uh, I, but it's the, the interim, the interim damage is, uh, you know, from a client's spend perspective, and then from a facilities perspective in increased cost in mechanical and electrical with running your 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 have act harder and longer and you know increased cleaning costs and, and things like that but i think for yet yeah, certainly flexible working is here to stay uh the 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 workplace will never i don't think certainly not in our industry perhaps won't be you know identical to the way it was and i don't think you know my son who's uh, nine years old now i don't think he'll ever have a fixed desk i mean i don't have a crystal ball but uh we would go we were going down the route of you know suddenly here at Havas, even our ceo and coo they don't have offices we would go the world the, the world was going to officeless working and now you know we're, we're going to deskless working or well, certainly not your own desk <laughs> okay thank you um, Richard, um, similar sort of question, you know, if you look at higher education um, and it's the pandemic impact on higher education, what, what, what sort of differences do you see going forward and what sort of issues do you think Kings will need to grapple with over the coming years? I'd be, I'd be quite surprised if we didn't retain some kind of um, online teaching capacity. Um, you know, we, we, we we work in a very expensive city and unsurprisingly our, our student residences are some of the most expensive for any university in the country. Um, so if you then had the option, uh, I, I know it's not just about the teaching, um, there's a whole experience of being a student and going to university, uh, but if you could um, somehow minimise your cost of staying in a residence but still get a, a degree from King's or indeed UCL or Imperial or, um, or LSE, um, at, without incurring the cost of actually living in London, um, then I think some people would probably probably uh, be very keen on doing that. So I'd be surprised if we didn't. Um, it won't it won't um, ever, I don't think, replace uh, face to face teaching, but some kind of blended model is possibly here to stay, um, depending on the course you do, of course. Um, I think as well. Uh, I, I, I yeah. The, all the building work is still going on, but you know we we've had we spent a lot of time working with our partner NHS organisations in um, working up master plans for developing how uh, the site around Guy's and the site around St Thomas's certainly are going to look like in in five, ten, fifteen, twenty years time. Um, King certainly has 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 all but stopped its capital plan as a result of the pandemic to to basically try and claw back some money from there. Um, so it, it will likely restart again, but all of those uh, long term um, master planning, which is predicated on, on our 2029 vision and, and the vision of our partner, partner NHS trusts, uh, that's pushed back. And, and of course, if you push something back a year or two, then, then potentially you can have a different view on it. So it can be completely different. And I do think there will be 
if we do move into we've got we've got uh, two or three buildings which are almost exclusively office based staff um, and and certainly one of them has been there's been rumors of us uh, trying to trying to um, realize the uh, the asset value of that for some time and invest elsewhere um, so yeah things like things like uh, and more home working may push that along a bit quicker Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, so I've got a question, um, a further question for both of you before we pick up any questions from attendees and, and open to the floor, as it were, the virtual floor. Um, so, Joe, um, what sort of three things have you learned along the way in responding to the pandemic over the last uh, period um, that you would you would say have been the biggest lessons learned for you yourself? Oh, um, God, what the three biggest lessons learned? I think, I mean, I, 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 I've come to think sort of differently, not necessarily differently, but of, of health and safety law, because usually it's always been prescribed to us in such a way that you it's it's sort of easy to write your risk assessments around there and 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 um and and fit the prescription to your business model so to essentially tick all of the health and safety boxes that you're required to do by law but with this i think we've seen of you know the government and the hse and all of these all of these bodies that that we're so used to just you know having the advice stipulated to us where you can't always wait for someone to tell you what to do we've had to make decisions without all of the information being available to us at any given time and and they've they've not all all you know been great necessarily and you know you can always it's a very fluid certainly this risk assessment our covid risk assessment which is on sort of iteration 6.2 i think at the minute has been has changed you know on a weekly basis since we opened as as we're realizing you know what's working what's not working government advice changing hse advice is changing all of these things so it's been a very moving target so from a health and safety perspective uh big lessons learned there and also it makes you think that uh, there is some, not necessarily leniency is not perhaps the right word, but there's some flexibility within health and safety law that we all thought was actually very an uber prescriptive, um, you, you know, law actually it's, you know, opens a lot of interpretation. I think certainly that that's my biggest and Johnny might need to come back to me to think of the next two. OK, thank, <laughs> thank you, Joe. And, and Richard, from your point of view, what would have been the sort of biggest lessons learned, um, I guess, either personally or corporately? I think I, I think some of them probably uh, are, are, are yet to come to fruition. Um, uh, but I think <clears throat> there was one. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely one thing we did very early on in, in, in the first lockdown. We, we saw, of course, uh, I mentioned we were under huge pressure uh, financially. We saw a huge opportunity to actually just mothball a lot of buildings and save you know, our utilities, um, save on save on water. Uh, so we literally did. We shut the doors, turned the water off, turned the power off, and and, and just left those buildings. Um, and yeah, there was quite a bit of uh, a short-term gain there, uh, and we did save quite a bit of money. But actually, um, we then had to try and open the buildings up quite quickly, uh, quicker than we actually planned to, uh, and uh, which was hugely challenging, particularly around uh, uh, the water supply. So I think there's, uh, yeah, I, if I was doing it again, I think I'd think more. I, I, I guess we didn't know it was going to go on for this long right at the start. Um, I think, again, we'd probably trade off some of the uh, the short term gain for the long term pain. Uh, I, I guess I guess other lessons learned. I probably I'm probably cheating a bit, to be honest, because I think it's um, it's not exactly a lesson learned. It's more of a, a reaffirmation of, of things I already know. One of them is definitely about um, about how resilient facilities professionals are, how dedicated they are in, in keeping whatever organisation they're running going. Um, not always appreciated, I think, by their by their organisations, but um, it's certainly uh, certainly clear to me how my teams um, reacted to, uh, to to the pandemic and, and, and how, how, how hard they've worked. 
in all kinds of areas to, to keep the university going and, and getting it up and running again and then locking it down again and, um, and everything else. And again, another thing, another uh, reaffirmation for me is is the importance of um, universities that work with NHS trusts and how much they rely on each other um, for support. Um, it can be a one way street sometimes, but actually over the over the period of those long term relationships, they are two way streets. You know, we've uh, we've been absolutely delighted to be able to help um, our partner in HS Trust in, in, in dealing with things that we never thought we'd have to deal with, you know, just storage of extra beds and ventilators and, and even belongings of people um, who've gone into uh, you know, ultimately some of whom have, have passed away. Um, so it, it's been it's been really really reassuring for me to know that actually despite the fact that i guess it's like a sibling relationship some of the universities and the, and the nhs trust they work alongside um we don't always get along but absolutely we absolutely need each other and when times are hard we properly rely on each other oh thank you richard i'm just going to open to to, to questions from the attendees there's one i'll come back to you in a second and then um, once we've um, got some questions um, from our attendees, I'll be asking Joe and Richard to give us some closing advice for people to take away. And Rudy will wrap up in a couple of moments. So, Joe, there was a question from the floor um, asking, in the event that um, Havas have a positive test from an employee, how do you respond? Do you ask all of the employees in contact with that individual to um, self-isolate? Um, and uh, interestingly, the question was do the company continue to pay the individual? Uh, yes, uh, for, to, to answer that last bit, yeah, our um, people and talent teams uh, ha have been very, very good with with uh, making sure that everyone is fully remunerated uh, if they've needed, um, you know, to go home and self-isolate. Certainly the vast majority of the business actually can do their jobs from home. In the case of, you know, our team, the um, the people that that uh, porter things around the building, they who cannot at all do their jobs from home on the handyman, for instance, were still fully remunerated. Um, and likewise, when they're all on furlough, you know, those people at the lower end of the wage structure were topped up to 100 percent and the people on the higher salaries uh, got the 80 percent. Um, but sir, what we have is we have a QR code on every desk. And in every meeting room, you must scan your QR code. If you haven't scanned your QR code by 10 o'clock in the morning, you get a follow up email. If you still haven't scanned your QR code by lunchtime, our security manager, who is quite an intimidating gentleman, <laughs> he's lovely, but you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's, an, he's an old prop. I think he plays semi pro rugby. Um, so he comes around and kindly asks you to scan your QR code. So everyone scans their QR code. So what we have is a database that we can use and see who sat next to what person because so we go from two days before the onset of symptoms of the suspected case we also treat suspected and confirmed cases identically so if someone's suspected or if someone's rings us up and says i've had a test and i'm confirmed we look at the plan and we say we essentially it usually goes if there's a bank of deaths say it's a bank of eight everyone on that bank and the two banks decide will have to go home sounds like a lot of people but actually because you're only utilizing half the desk because half of them are crossed off it's not so many so we know what meeting rooms they've been in who they've been in meetings with who they've been sat near and then also based on anecdotal evidence as to did they have lunch in the canteen who did they sit with that sort of thing we hand over the information to our people and talent teams who contact the, the staff members and ask that they stay home itself i say if it's a confirmed case or if it's a suspected case pending the result of of the test. And uh, Joe, a supplementary question. Do you have in-house testing facilities in place or, or do you rely on the sort of NHS infrastructure? So we we had got some tests and we, we mainly for the building services team because we, in the nature, we were doing sort of an AB rotor, but it really threw things off when, you know, someone, we, we had a case where someone was suspected and then half of the team had to go out and it's, you know, you almost can't run the office. So, um, so we had some, but actually it, we, we didn't want to take, 
with the thought of uh, you know false positives, or actually the other way around, you uh, you know. Um, we didn't want to take the burden of responsibility on that. So actually, we decided that we would use the government provided facilities. OK, thank you, Joe. So um, uh, I guess you you guys have um, brought out a number of things um, through the, the, the last sort of 40, 50 minutes. Um, I think you've which have resonated with me. Um, Joe said, aren't we just a resilient bunch as people? And uh, I think Richard was indicating what what an impact the um, the FM teams have um, been able to deliver for their organizations and the roller coaster ride at the pandemic and responding to it and keeping everything moving forward. Um, a number of people have sort of reiterated those those comments from the floor. So before I hand back to Ru Rudy and just in closing, um, Richard, what sort of advice would you offer the people on the call here and now moving forward? Um, well, I think it's it's absolutely clear that the, the world can't live without us. <laughs> mm. How critical FM is. You know, we, we've, I, I've, I've certainly, in, in, from my perspective, I, I'm now dealing with a lot of people uh, in Kings on a regular basis and they are relying on, on things that I am, and my colleagues are providing for them. Um, so, I, and I'm sure the same is true uh, with uh, everyone, everyone, um, everyone who's joined us today. Um, and I think that this bit of advice that I'm, I need to follow myself is just to make sure, take advantage of the fact that, that our profile is raised within our organisation and make sure it stays at that high level, which it should be. It absolutely should be. Okay, so don't underestimate our importance. Uh, yeah. Great advice, great advice. And Joe, in, in closing, what advice would you, you offer to, to everybody on the call? Apart from echoing Richard's uh, sentiment that yes, every facilities professional in the UK wants a 10% pay rise, I think what I would implore people to do is, it's easy to get bogged down you know, in the now of COVID, but actually, I think trying to, you know, plan going forward and all of the risk perception, certainly what we're looking at now is there's a whole new whole host of risks we're facing with, you know, all of our working from home risk assessments, all the DSEs working from home, people alone working from home, the whole mental health piece, well-being, all of this sort of stuff. I think you've got to, you've got to keep, obviously, Keep your, 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 your company and your staff and your clients safe in the here and now. But, um, you know, even when COVID's been and gone, just the new way of working will present a whole load of new challenges that, that you know, we must be ready for. OK, thank you. Um, personally, I want to thank Richard and Joe for fascinating insight and being open and honest with us over the last um 50 minutes or so. I'm going to pass over to, to my colleague Rudy, who's going to wrap us up and close us out. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, so, f first of all, if, if anybody's got any follow up questions or you'd like to get in touch with us, um, I've put uh, John's details up on there. Uh, do get in touch. Uh, have a look at our website. Uh, we'd love your feedback about uh, this session and any other session and any anything that's of interest that, that uh, we can help with. Uh, we like to hear from people who, who like to hear from us. It, it means that uh, we get the validation we require, uh, as Richard said, um, and I'm going to ask for a 10% pay round rise as well. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's, that's a good start. Um, and then last but not least, I want to thank you both, Joe and Richard. Thanks for your time. Uh, thanks everybody else who, who's joined us today. Uh, I know everybody's time is valuable and it's a difficult and, and busy time. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your inputs. We've had some very, very interesting comments and so forth. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Our next webinar is a nice uh, symmetrical date, the, the 21st of January 2021. Uh, so, so note that in your diary. It, it will be at 11 o'clock, same as this one. Uh, we haven't decided the topic yet, but we'll, we'll let you know through our usual channels when we get to that. And finally, since this is the last one before Christmas, uh, festive greetings to everybody. Uh, have, a, have a great festive season uh, and celebrate as much as you're able to. Uh, obviously, the usual Christmas parties won't apply, but um, we might have some Zoom Christmas parties and so forth to look forward to. And, and have a great uh, festive season and a, and a good 2021. So thank you for your time and uh, we'll, we'll see you on the other side of the new year. Thank you very much and goodbye. Uh
And once again, thank you to Joe and uh, Richard for sharing their experiences. Thank you, everybody, and bye-bye.